Good morning, everyone. This is a packed house. This is excellent. It's so good to see you here. Um, first thing, uh, welcome to wildlife conservation in the age of AI. My name is Meredith Palmer. Um, I'm with Fauna and Flora International, but you are not here to see me. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome our panel this morning to talk about AI. We have a really delightful mix of practitioners um, and developers um, to share their perspectives on the applications, again, of AI to address wildlife conservation challenges. Uh, so today, you'll be hearing from Katie Garwood, um, a research associate. Oh, wait, do I have a... Here we go. I was prepared. Um, Katie Garwood, a research associate at the Conservation Technology Lab at the San Diego Zoo. Um, you, she works with uh, software and hardware projects in the tech lab, as well as integrating various sensors and data loggers um, into Earth Ranger for operations around the world. We also have Sam Kelly, an engineer with expertise in physical, electronic, and hardware design for conservation technology projects. He is the project lead for Sentinel, a smart camera trap developed by the Conservation X Labs. Uh, then we have Paul Khalil, a consultant for aerospace and bioenergy sectors who has co-founded T4C, Tech for Conservation, uh, which is a Canadian nonprofit that delivers effective and innovative technologies to researchers and conservationists um, who struggle to develop solutions for themselves. Um, and lastly, just Tim. <laughs> Tim, Tim von Dershen, the founder of Hack the Planet, you've uh, probably seen him down in the, you've probably seen half of these guys down in the vendor space, actually. Um, but Tim, founder of Hack the Planet, a division of the tech agency Q42, um, where you solve global challenges with technology. Um, and so, just as a quick overview of how this session is going to proceed, I have a list of questions to guide the first half hour or so of this conversation, um, and then we'll have time at the end for questions from the audience. And so, for the record, Tim asked me to kick this session off by asking everyone on the panel if AI was coming for our jobs. And because it obviously is, I'm gonna move on to the next question, um, which is how is AI being used to protect wildlife? And so I'd like to give each of the panelists um, a few minutes, you guys have a microphone, if you could pass that around. Um, just to describe the application of AI uh, for wildlife monitoring or protection in the programs that you work with. And so if we could start with Katie and then move our way down the panel. Sure, hello. So, uh, so I work at the San Diego Zoo in the Conservation Tech Lab, and there's one project specifically that we've rolled out and we've implemented at our, we have a large reserve right outside of the safari park at the zoo, and it's about 900 acres. And we have a lot of local researchers that work on uh, cougars, cougar research and a lot of other local species. And so one thing that we wanted to implement was a real-time detection system that's based on an array of cellular camera traps around the reserve. And so it can send, as soon as a photo is taken, that photo, I don't know if we wanna pull up. A I had your slide and then I didn't. Oh, it's okay, no, it's no worries. So uh, just to explain, um, the way the system works is so the cellular camera traps take a photo, it gets uploaded, it, they're based on the cellular system. And then uh, we have a virtual computer that's running our software called Cougar Vision at all times. And it's basically pulling these photos as they come in and it's running a detector on them, which basically is able to detect the animals that might be in the photo. And then if, if there is an animal in the photo, it gets run through our classifier and we have a custom trained classifier that's based on our local species in the Southwest United States region. And uh, they, if the species of interest is detected, you, it will send an email alert to specified emails that we have in the park that are interested in knowing if there's a detection. And it's also integrated with Earth Ranger, so that detection photo will get uploaded to Earth Ranger on our instance in the location that the photo was taken. So that's kind of the system that we've implemented at the park, and it's been really helpful for our researchers to know, you know, real time when those species of interest are detected. And it's not necessarily just for cougars, even though it's called cougar vision. You can use any classifier model uh, that we've we've custom trained a couple, one for Kenya species and some for uh, Peru spe animal species, and so it can detect any species that are in those lists. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Sam? Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, uh, I am the uh, lead for Sentinel, which is a uh, project that Conservation X Labs 
the basic idea behind what, what we're building was we see there's a lot of camera traps out there realizing that, and we've talked about this at the conference, uh, uh, and, uh, there's been a number of people raise this issue of you know, connectivity being an issue, being able to get real-time data back from the field. Um, and so the idea behind Sentinel is that we upgrade existing camera traps that you'd put out you know, and periodically check every three months and try to get that data coming in in a kind of more continuous fashion. Um, so what it does is it attaches to your existing trail camera, your bush now, your browning, whatever you choose to use, uh, and gives it an ability to process AI on, on the device itself and then send that information back over uh, a, a number of communications channels, but I think most relevant for everyone here is, is satellite. Um, <clears throat> and one of the big things here that we realize for AI specifically is that, at least how we view AI within Conservation X Labs, is that it is answering a very specific question you have of your future data. <clears throat> and since everyone has a different question, for the most part, it means that everyone needs a different model. Um, and so we have, uh, when, when, when you work with, with us, uh, we work with you to craft a specific model that is an answering a question you have uh, that is relevant to your field work. Um, so you can start to get that information coming in in real time. Um, the system is uh, integrated with Earth Ranger uh, and it's also integrated with Gundy. So theoretically, although we haven't done this yet, it would integrate with Smart. Uh, and the idea being here is that we're trying to really increase uh, the ability to apply and, and allocate resources for those that are down on the field. Um, you know, allocating where Rangers should should go based on certain uh, events that happen in the field in close to real time. Uh, and so right now we are operating in, in about in six countries and have uh, just over 100 devices deployed in the last three months. We're just starting to scale up uh, and, and learn the challenges associated with, with doing that. I'll leave it there. Super. Thank you. Paul? Great. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so I'm one of the founders of Tech for Conservation uh, and our primary goal, Canadian nonprofit, and our primary objective is to find technology that a conservationists might need, uh, validate that need, and then deliver that technology to the conservation organizations. Um, our flagship product at the moment is the African Carnival Wild Book, uh, an AI-based uh, tool for photographic mark recapture study based on the Wild Book <coughs> excuse me, platform developed by Wild Me out of Portland, Oregon. And our focus here, uh, based on feedback from folks that we spoke to before we did this um, was really to address the need of identifying individual carnivores, uh, change that from a manual process to something that's uh, AI supported and uh, a lot more efficient. So we've deployed um, and we have users now in 15 countries uh, in Africa for ACW and at the, mo at the moment 152 users on the system. Um, at the, and that currently supporting ID on 10 carnivore species in Africa. Yeah. Tim, please. Right, so hi, my name is Tim. Uh, I'm the founder of Hacked Planet. Uh, you've probably seen me defend our marketplace with my colleague Thijs. If you haven't, uh, please visit us. Uh, so basically, um, we're, we're engineers, so we call, ourselves, we call ourselves nerds. We're not like in the field specifically to sell products. So what we do, we are part of a larger organization called Q42, um, and we're just engineers. We're just creating software, we're creating awesome tech, and we're just trying to you know, look at what is needed in the field of conservation. Um, so that stum that uh, so we stumbled actually we stumbled upon the the whole camera trapping in 2018 where we learned when I f for the first time saw a camera trap and I think my story is a little bit sim similar to to Sam and we you know try to work closely together as well so we saw the camera trap and we were like this is this is this should be you know it should be more efficient right I mean walking towards a camera trap and retrieve your SD card you know while we were sitting at home. Uh, working with clients, doing all sorts of AI and machine learning projects, we were like, we can do this, you, we can make this better. So we actually started uh, diving into that, to into that topic and we just said, well, we have to, we ha we have to come up with something that, that can do that automatically. So that's what we did. We did a, a, the, the first big project actually that we did was in Gabon. 
uh, where we deployed uh, 15 of these smart camera traps. So we actually now have a camera trap that has a box, and you know the camera sends a, sends a picture to the box, and there's machine learning on there, and you know a pretty similar story to Sam. It sends out the, the classified results. So basically, on Earth Ranger, you get a notification when there's an elephant walking past the camera trap, right? So normally something that you had to wait for like maybe months before if you, you got the SD card back. So that's something that we do, and we really try to learn. We're not, we're not saying, like, okay, we have this uh, super polished product that you, the product that you can buy, and it's all finished. We're trying to look with clients and national parks to see how we can help them and, uh, and, and get the right solution in place. So next to that, so, so we have a, cam a smart camera trap system that uses machine learning. We also have something that's uh, been used in the field of anti-poaching. It's a cell phone sensor, basically. So it's a si similar, similar thing where we learn about anti-poaching. We didn't know anything about poaching in general. So we just you know, talked to rangers and talked to national parks, and we learned about the poaching problem. And we figured, well, there must be an, a clever way to you know, detect the presence of humans in national parks. And if you are a little, 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 little bit similar to me, you're always walking around with your phone, right? So we know that people walk around with their phones, even poachers. So what we did is we created a, a sensor, a smart sensor, that can actually detect the presence of phones. Uh, also, it's integrated in Earth Ranger, so you get like alerts when you see phones in your park. And there's all sorts of smart things and AI going on there. Uh, we can do all sorts of clever things with, 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 uh, with triangulation, and eventually we can do things with prediction algorithm. But it's just that, you know, I don't believe there's like this one uh, uh, golden solution. We have to really, you know, in, in terms of AI, we have to really work together and see where AI can uh, benefit the processes that are in place in national parks. What a, what a positive spin on AI to end us off with. Um, thank you, guys. So our, our next question that we have is for the, uh, for the AI curious, the ecologists or conservationists out there, um, practitioners who are interested in what AI has to offer but aren't really sure where to start. Um, and Sam, I feel like we had a good conversation about this yesterday, so I was wondering if you might be able to lead us up on this question about what people... Um, like what they may not know about AI that they should know if they're interested in using it in their conservation program. And then panel, do feel free to follow up. Um. Yeah, sure. I think I touched on this just briefly in my intro. Um, but, you know, really understanding that AI is essentially asking, it's answering a question you have predefined, right? So uh, if you have a, an interest in understanding when there are elephants, uh, and, and, you know, walking past your camera, you're going to make an elephant algorithm, et cetera. So you can't, you, you have to really define what that question is. Um, and uh, I think, you know, framing that question properly is, is I think, half of, half of the challenge. Um, obviously, you need data to be able to train things. Um, but I think one thing that, that we struggle with um, communicating is that the AI is not going to, the AI algorithms aren't going to be 100% correct. Um, and this is always going to be a challenge, um, particularly when you have uh, scenarios that you are going to respond um, with resources on the ground. So understanding and communicating that to, to people using our system. You know, if we are, an example I like to give, we had a recent um, deployment and uh, it, the, the model we had successfully uh, filtered out 500 blank images. I know that's a big problem for people using camera traps, a lot of false triggers. So successfully did that, 100% correct. Uh, we correctly classified around 60 animals, uh, and then the, but there were two pictures that were incorrectly uh, uh, identified, and that's the thing that is immediately uh, noticed by, by people using the system. And so just realizing that although we were at what, up, up around, you know, above 90%, 95% accuracy, that is still like an issue when, when people first interact with AI. Um, so building that trust around what the model will actually look like uh, is, is part of the challenge. But also recognizing that, that, um, that humans also aren't 100% accurate. Um, we, we've done some, some, some studies on that and we, we find that um, in some situations, humans aren't, aren't, aren't above 90% accuracy. Are you, are you throwing us under the bus? <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Uh, we, we did a, one study with uh, the Nature Conservancy on a huge data set. It was around uh, 10 million photos, and, and the uh, two human auditors only agreed with each other 93% of the time. So you start to see, like, you know, there is a little bit, even if you do have humans manually um, auditing the data, there is still that, that challenge. So, yeah. I think uh, to, to add to that, the, the impact, though, in terms of efficiency is enormous. So 
even though you may not be reaching perfection in terms of accuracy, the productivity gains just blow the socks off everything else. So the switch from a manual process, the experience, and we've had some paper published on this, uh, in terms of ID of individuals, uh, we've seen definite improvements when historical data sets are run through. And that's an important lesson, I think, that folks have learned, is that uh, you do need to look at the data that you're putting into these systems. And I know, you know, Sam's referring to real-time data. In our case, often this is historical data or it's data that is uh, being generated uh, actively to support a particular census or a particular approach for biodiversity measurement. And you have to think that through before you dive in and start to, to try and use the tool. And so that's an important part of what we deliver as a service uh, is to help you with your onboarding, not just in training of the system, but also how to structure your data appropriately to get the results that you're looking for and not, uh, you know, we've all heard the bad data in, you're going to get garbage out, uh, and that's a real risk with AI as well. Yeah, so I totally agree on that. Uh, we often get the question, and uh, people just email us and ask, what does the system cost? And, you know, it's really good to realize that it's not uh, a, a product that you can buy in the stores yet, right? I mean, like in this, uh, this, in this year, 2023, uh, it's, uh, you, know, you have to really be, uh, be a little bit patient with the, with the product and the, and the whole uh, AI process for that matter. Um, so we always say, you know, we don't actually sell the product directly to you because we know from experience that if you deploy these products, there's a lot of support needed for that. So people need to be looking very carefully, the, exactly what Sam uh, just mentioned, is that, you know, what's coming out of the system? How much uh, false positives, I mean, do we, do we actually have? And that's something that we experienced in Gabon and in Zimbabwe recently as well. And you get a lot of data from the system. So, you know, the, the first thing that we always ask if, if we start working with someone, who is going to look at the data? Who is going to look at the alerts in Earth Ranger? Do you have actually people that, you know, can, uh, can analyze what's, what's coming from the, from the system and, and respond to that and work with us to, you know, uh, validate these, uh, these results so that we can, can optimize it? It's really a matter of, you know, tuning the system the whole time. It's, it's in, indeed, it's like data in, uh, results out, so to say. So if the data is, is, is garbage, the results will be, will be not will not be as good, but what I wanted to point out is that um, it, it shouldn't be uh, uh, set you back not using AIs because is it because it could be you know difficult. It's uh, I would invite people to you know work with uh, engineers in this field to really try to understand this this pattern and and this behavior and really you know like what Sam was mentioning as well is you know why are these why are these false positives? What's happening in the system, and how can we optimize that? And if we, you know, sometimes we don't even understand, as engineers, we don't even understand that why it's happening. But we have to, you know, try to dive into that and optimize it, and then from there on we can create a better and better system. But it's not going to be happening overnight. It's not something that you can sell with deploy in your park and it magically works. We need to, you know, it's trial and error. Yeah, that, those are great points. I mean, yeah, something to keep in mind with AI is that it's a constant process of always looking at your data and always validating it yourself so that maybe you can make changes to your model or uh, other things. But um, one thing that's um, really beneficial, like at the zoo that we're able to have is that we do have a team of engineers that's able to work on and implement these solutions. And what that means is that we can have a little bit more of a technical approach to how we implement these systems in the sense that we provide Cougar Vision, for example, as open source. So anybody you know, on GitHub can go and download it themselves. But the thing about that is that you do need to have more of a technical background to be able to implement and be able to, you know, soup to nuts, be able to incorporate that yourself into your system. And so that's why it's really beneficial to have you know, services available that can assist organizations with implementing AI, helping them implement AI because it is, you know, a very complex and very new field. And so to have uh, resources available for, you know, organizations to be able to assist them with implementing those technologies. But just one thing to note is that there are, you know, open source and free resources available for people who do have that more technical knowledge base and are able to maybe look into those solutions themselves and test them out. So there's definitely a broad range of, you know, uh, availability of being able to implement these solutions. 
so that AI isn't out of reach of some of us who might not be so well-funded or technologically literate. And for myself, like I didn't have any AI experience going into my job, but now I'm able to you know, speak about this. And so I just want to encourage you all that it's, it's not out of reach and there are you know, resources available and there's, it's, it's an emerging field and there's a lot of opportunity out there. So. Oh, th thank you. I think that leads really nicely into the, the next question I wanted to ask. Um, because I very much identify more on the practitioner end of the spectrum than the, the developer end when it comes to AI. And so AI is a, is a rapidly evolving field. Um, we get a new chat GPT every week, right? Um, and as a practitioner that uses AI, I have a strong sense of the disconnect between what people uh, think is possible to do with AI and then what AI can actually pull off um, for your programs, which isn't to say there isn't a great deal of potential using AI on your projects. Um, but I did want to ask the panel to speak a little bit more to maybe the fallibility of AI or to give us a more grounded understanding of when you're trying to bring AI into wildlife conservation, what is working well and what isn't. Um, and so Paul, do you want to start us off on this one? Uh, so looking forward in terms of where we going from where we are today, um, specifically in the field of uh, individual ID, an important step forward we feel is the ability to downsize the AI code, the tools, to work on edge devices. And so whether that's your cell phone that you can then take into the field or on the camera trap, the ability to not just say, okay, I've seen a leopard, but now which leopard have you seen? And where else has that leopard been seen? And that, for us, is the next frontier, if you like, for the individual ID work that we're currently uh, delivering to, to end users. Yeah, I think as far as uh, models go, if you're talking about like what AI can detect really reliably, I think um, if people have touched AI in this field, um, you may be familiar with a model called Mega Detector. It um, basically filters out um, human, animal, and vehicle, which obviously for a lot of use cases is sufficient, particularly if you're looking at uh, anti-poaching um, uh, measures, particularly for human and vehicle. Um, where you start to get com complexities in the system is where you're starting to ask uh, yeah, again, more complex questions if you're trying to discern, you know, similar species or, or species that are um, more elusive or aren't captured clearly in, in images, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> for people that have reviewed camera trap data, um, often the, uh, there is a little bit of context with the labels that go into, to the, um, into the images. So you may see a sequence of images, for example, where an animal walks up too close to the camera and then you just have a wall of fur or you know, an elephant's side. Um, and you know that is an, a certain species based on the context of that, um, of that image sequence, but you know, for a, a, mo a model that's trying to guess that, it often gets, th that can be tough. So I think there's some, some additional uh, research that can be done uh, around incorporating the expertise and, and knowledge of how I guess practitioners process image data sets and trying to incorporate that into, into some of the models that, that get put on devices and, and into systems. Yeah, so um, one thing that we notice, you know, implementing our models is uh, they work, since we train our own models for, you know, the purposes that we have in the park and elsewhere, um, we're lucky in that we have a lot of data that is very similar to the data we end up needing to classify. So that means we use the, you know, the same camera traps, the same, usually it's a very similar backgrounds, and so we know what data we're gonna end up getting so we can train our models to, that can account for the data we're gonna end up being able to classify. And so because sometimes you can run into issues when you try to implement a model on data that's kind of, has some differences from the data that it was trained on, and so that just is another reason that it's important to make sure you're looking at your outputs and seeing what it's classifying things as so you can see if your model's actually working for you. Uh, but yeah, so we noticed that it's important to be able to, you know, have models trained on data that's gonna be similar to what it's, you're gonna end up classifying. Yeah, so in terms of what's working well, so some, some years ago, uh, when we first visited Gabon, where we deployed our first camera trap, 
so our smart camera trap that can automatically detect uh, the forest elephant. We were working together with Breeze, it's a, it's a ranger in the Lope National Park, and we, uh, we showed them the camera trap and how it works. And uh, we had it, we had the, 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 the bridge, uh, we call it that connects to the camera trap, we had it on laundry lines, so we had like 10 of those just you know, to, to, to check if everything works and you know, we explained the whole system and then he repeated what, what, what we were explaining to him. So he said, well, okay, so the, the camera is sending the picture to the bridge and then it automatically classifies the photo and then I get an, a message, a WhatsApp message on my phone. And it was magic to him. It was like, wow, I mean, this is gonna change my life. So in terms of what's working well, I mean, look at how far we have come with AI. Like, like I said, in 2018, I, I saw a Bushnell for the first time in my life with an SD card. And now we're talking about automatically classifying images on devices. So a lot of stuff is, is, is working really, really well. So I'm really positive in, in the next years, I will probably will see a lot of these uh, solutions being optimized, at least from our side. Uh, we're working on that uh, very well. So, um, and, and a lot of stuff can, can, can be better as well. And it, and it really uh, is in the, in, in, in the field of hardware for, for my sense. I mean, on the software side, a lot of things is, are happening very fast. And, you know, Mega Detector was just being uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, so if, if we have a very powerful machine, we can do very powerful things. You see the things happening with ChatGPT as well. You just mention it. Every week there's a new version of GPT coming out. So that's, you know, powerful machines doing powerful stuff. But now we need to have that same power, like, in, in, in the bush, right, in a tree. So that's why we need it. We need these eyes that are being super intelligent and being super powerful to automatically uh, classify what's on the photo. And that's a, that's a challenge that we're facing uh, these days. And the same goes for, you know, uh, detecting individual species. You know, we see cameras from mobile phones getting better and better. So there will be a time where we can have such a great amount of detail in a photo that we, we just take with your mobile phone or, or anything and that we can use that data and, and, and much faster get, get results. So yeah, that's what I see. I just want, just want to add something to that. Uh, because uh, our system is also a repository for data that builds up over time, um, it, we've established a policy in terms of data staying in the system. Um, there is, and we've discovered, uh, uh, sort of the research world where folks come in, a student comes in, works on projects for a while, and then disappears. And very often, their data disappears with them. And we see it really being important that as you start to build this and to support your ability to do longitudinal studies, that you support that kind of a program where this data doesn't disappear with that transient, as, uh, as we've labeled them, uh, researcher, uh, who has moved on to some other project somewhere else in the world um, without any ill intention, but when all that data disappears with them, that leaves the parent organization uh, with really no options. And so that's an important data management policy that we've implemented with the support and input of our users because it allows for that buildup of data which you can then revisit in the future and extract more information from as you get a more intelligent AI uh, to support you or whatever other process that you follow. Any other thoughts from the, all right. Oh, yeah, more thoughts. Yeah, no, I was just gonna add, um, so I just wanna note, you know, that there's like a, a there can be a difference between, um, you know, like being, have, needing to upload lots of historical data to classify in big batches and, you know, there's a difference between doing classifications in like a cloud-based software where you might not have the computational power to be able to run these models yourself on your data. And so there needs to be a lot of computer power that is able to run these models. And then there's edge AI use cases where you have much smaller models usually that are able to run you know, off, off grid and somewhere else and those can have very different use cases. Um, and you're usually much more specific to the task in the edge AI sense versus, you know, needing to utilize a, maybe a, a much more precise or much more complex model in, you know, a cloud-based software versus an edge AI device. But. Somewhat related to that, I, I see this is also a challenge I've seen in a, speaking to people that, that people do have 
tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of photos sitting on, on hard drives and, and, and may not have the connectivity or the storage space or budget to be able to put that into the cloud platforms. And I think that is still a challenge that we see in the space. So there are a number of cloud platforms that you may be aware of, things like Wildlife Insights, where actually getting the data into these platforms is, is a big part of the challenge for people in the field, just because you've got gigabytes or even terabytes of data just, just um, sitting there. So that's a major challenge. 100%. So I guess what I'm, I'm hearing from you guys then is there's a lot of exciting new frontiers as we get more data and better AI and better hardware, but there's still these hidden human costs and connectivity costs and um, you know, resourcing costs that people don't necessarily know about going into these programs. Um, fantastic. So moving us along, um, as I said at the beginning, I think the great thing about this panel is that we have perspectives from both kind of the development end of the spectrum through to the deployment side of AI. Um, and I'd like to explore next important lessons learned, um, both from those conservationists who want to use AI in their conservation practice, uh, but then also would be keen to get some feedback from developers who haven't, didn't see a camera trap until five years ago, you know, who are now entering the world of conservation and what you came out of that with. Uh, so, Tim, do you want to start us off on that one? Uh, yeah, well, well, that's a good remark. I mean, uh, we actually learned very, very much. So, for starters, like how the whole conservation world, world works in, in general. So, from, from that on, like I, I just described, we developed several products. Um, yeah, and, 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 and no, um, in line of, 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 of these products, even like something like uh, human e human elephant conflicts. So I think there are a lot of uh, clever connections to make. So when we first developed the smart camera trap, we at the same time we learned about uh, human elephant conflicts. And you know what happened is that we were actually in a field near a farmer, and he explained what he was doing. And when elephants were nearby, he would go out of his uh, house and he would be banging on metal drums. And there we were, like in that same field, just deployed a smart camera trap where we know, well, we know that there's an elephant out there. If, this, if he's walking on that trail, you shouldn't, be able, you, you shouldn't go out and, and, and you know, hit these metal drums. We can, we can do that for you, we can automate that. So I think there, uh, there are a lot of uh, clever connections uh, to be made. So that's actually what we created. We created an elephant repeller, basically, that connects to our smart camera trap and now automatically you know, creates sounds, uh, lights, and we deployed it uh, this year in, uh, in Zambia at the Elephant uh, Release Facility in Kafur National Park. And we actually, you know, we, we're now getting data back from that, from that system and we see that it works. We see how the elephant responds to that. And uh, because they're not startled, there's a, lot, there's a, there's a, a big uh, distance between the camera trap and the actual system that, you know, produces these sounds and these lights. So these, the elephants, the, they, they hear it from the distance. So I think like, and this is why this conference is also uh, very helpful. You know, we should be sharing ideas on, on, all, this, uh, on all these matters. Um, and for us, what, what we see is that, you know, working closely together with our partners is really key. So, um, we know, this year as well, we had a very busy year, I realize that now, is that we went to uh, Zimbabwe as well, we deployed uh, uh, GSM sensors. Um, and, you know, it's not, you, go, you don't go there and, you know, you deploy it and you say goodbye. It's like you, you keep working with them and, and keep learning about uh, the data that's, that's coming uh, out of it. And from that point, you have to, you know, get get to, to new plans to start. You know, it, it has to be better and better and better each uh, each year. And I think that's that's the most uh, that's that's the biggest challenge to keep optimizing it and keep learning from each other. Sure. Um, I think for me, the big lesson uh, developing at least a hardware product in this space is being that the biggest challenges aren't necessarily the AI piece. Like, um, I mean that in the, in the sense that the first and second questions, usually in some order, are how long does the battery last and how much does it cost? Um, I think these are important considerations, at least I've learned, is that 
it's got to be super reliable in the field because people are investing time into deploying these resources, and if they don't work, it, it, it actually is a, a burden to, you know, or a, a time loss in, in putting these things out. So um, for me, that was a big lesson that, you know, reliability of the system is, is almost paramount. Um, uh, so, you know, <laughs> making a bulletproof, essentially, uh, and and that, that is a huge challenge when you're trying to develop something cutting edge, yet trying to make it simple, um, so, so anyone can deploy it, uh, but then also trying to make it uh, 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 affordable uh, to, to, to a number of users. So, so that piece, particularly when it comes to hardware, has been, I think, the biggest lesson we've learned in, in developing the product. Um, I think there's two big lessons I've learned. Um, one being that it's really important to be able to have the infrastructure to be able to, you know, do something if you, w with this knowledge and with this resource, like you, because you, you can, you know, classify, especially as it comes to real-time detection specifically, um, you can get a real-time detection, but if you don't have the resources in place to respond or, you know, somebody there to know that there's a detection and have somebody do something about it, then it's not really the, be the best tool that you might need. Um, and so being able to have, you know, systems in place and uh, being able to monitor those systems and being able to respond is really important. Um, and then another thing too, I think they all touched upon this, but like being able to work all together in such a, a new and emerging space, um, especially as it comes to models, we can all really help each other by, you know, using each other's products and really giving feedback uh, because we can only all improve our systems if we, have users that are able to use them and give us feedback and so we can improve them. And it's, it's since it's such a new space, it's really important to have such a collaborative, a collaborative environment for AI specifically. Uh, from, from our perspective, uh, we've learned that uh, not everybody can adopt this technology uh, at the same pace. So some organizations uh, we've been talking to for a long time and uh, tend, tend to want to set up a lot of stuff up front. Uh, others, we find there's an early adopter somewhere in the organization that's prepared to bootleg their way through this, and uh, we try and support those people. Um, the, the, the point, though, is that ultimately uh, this data belongs to the organization, typically although there are other arrangements that are out there. And we always have to be cognizant of data ownership and the ability and the security of that data as being absolutely critical to the trust that everybody has in us in terms of having that data, their data, sitting on a platform somewhere uh, available for matching to establish IDs. Um, so those are definitely things to consider. Um, you know, how you are going to manage your data uh, on this platform, and then, yeah, what the actionable data is that you're getting out of this platform, and what does that mean to you? So, uh, uh, you know, we try and support our users uh, going through that process, um, but obviously we also learn about their business. Like, for instance, a lot of people do a lot of desk work during the rainy season. Well, you know, sitting at our desks in, uh, in Canada, we're it's always raining in Canada, so it's pretty much all the time. But we, obviously there's a field season for many of the folks who use our systems, and so that means that they're out there doing real work, um, and at some point in time they get back to their desks and now they want to analyze everything that they've collected. And our system sees spikes in loads, and we have to be able to scale and support that uh, process. And uh, that's been an important learning for us through, through this entire exercise. Uh, yeah, just to emphasize on that one, um, I think it's, it's good to realize that, I mean, the things that we're doing, like AI in general, it's like, it's the state of the art technology, right? I mean, if you just look at, you know, in my country or other Western countries, how much people are actually, you know, working every day with AI, you know, apart from, you know, the, uh, the, the casual GPT uh, sentences you, you get out. It's not really that, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it is cutting edge. So I think the only reason why we're talking about AI in wildlife conservation is that it, it can potentially 
um, be so beneficial, and it's uh, it's so much. It's the time that we need, right? I mean, it's like especially the things that I've seen regarding poaching and stuff like that. It's uh, some areas do need like a lot more efficiency like right now. We don't have the time to wait. And this is where AI can be beneficial. This is why we are doing that right now. If we can set out like 500 rangers additional like in a national park, we, I mean, we would be doing that, right? But we don't have these 500 rangers. We don't have the budget for that. So we need to look uh, at, at smarter solutions. This is the only reason from my perspective, my opinion, that we're, that we're now stressing AI in this field. It's because it's needed, and we see that it can, you know, have this potential, like, amazing uh, uh, effect, effect on, on, on all the processes that we're doing. So, yeah. I think the other thing that, uh, the other impact we're going to see is that it allows us to ask questions and get answers that we couldn't uh, necessarily get answers for before. So, we all know there's an interplay between the large carnivore guild, and we all have uh, some uh, impression of what that is. But if you have a rich data set that's uh, highly accurate with all of these species and understanding the interplay between these species in your area of conservation or research, you're now starting to ask and answer questions that before you just dreamed about. And so this is you know, we, where I think we see the future of this is that we're, we're now going to be able to get a much richer view of what is happening uh, based on our ability to deal with these big data sets, but also have that level of um, prediction, if you like, but also uh, intelligence uh, supporting that, that analytical process. Anything else? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Uh, well, I have, I have one final question before I turn this over to the audience, before I unleash the audience. Um, and I think this is something we've been touching on throughout, like what's next in AI for wildlife? What's the next frontier? Where are we going with this? Um, I think we've raised some interesting things about edge AI and, and data sovereignty and big data sets and new developments in hardware and software. But if there's anything you weren't able to squeeze into our previous questions that you'd like to share, this is your space to tell us what we all should be looking forward to in the upcoming years. Um, and Katie, you started us off, so why don't you close us out? <laughs> Yeah, so I think uh, a lot of the people up here are uh, more familiar with the, uh, the image classification space and the uh, using computer vision. Um, at least that's a lot of what we've touched on, but there is a lot of other applications for AI in the space. And um, one specifically, I can speak to like a couple projects that are on the horizon for my lab, but I know a lot of other researchers are working on very similar projects. Um, so one of those is uh, using uh, accelerometer data or IMU data for behavior detection. Um, and so we're working on a project to be able to classify elephant behavior based on um, gathering a lot and labeling a lot of uh, elephant accelerometer data. And um, also a lot of audio classification work is being done for um, a lot of different regions. We're trying to work on a, a Peru-specific model. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of different applications, not just computer vision, but with a lot of different types of sensor data that you can think of that you might be able to get a lot, get a lot of data for and then try to make something that can end up predicting outcomes of that, but yeah. Yeah, totally agree on, on that computer vision is just one aspect of, of what, what AI can be used on. So whatever electronics or monitoring you guys are doing um, out there, there's certainly ways to apply uh, AI to, to those to those use cases. I think sticking within computer vision, um, some of the work that we've been doing at Conservation X Labs to kind of push beyond uh, just species classification, uh, we have been working on some uh, behavioral detection. So uh, working in a, in a Zala uh, around uh, gorilla behavior uh, and, and monitoring uh, as it relates to uh, social dynamics within within gorilla groups. Uh, and then also in uh, in Florida, in a uh, a subspecies of of mountain lion, or puma, or cougar, depending on your your choice of uh, of, of name, um, there is a, a disease that uh, affects. It's a neurological disease that affects how the animal walks, and we're able to detect that kind of thing in in video data from camera traps. So I think there's some some additional uh, potential. 
in, in, in using videos, for example, to, to understand health of animals. Uh, a final thing I'd add is that we have been working on image retrieval over satellite. And I think there is some really interesting work that can be done. This is slightly outside of the computer vision space, but around compression of data. Um, effectively, how at least I see it at a very technical level, the point of AI is that it is a data compressor or data filter right out there in the field, right? So if you're talking about tag or, or collar data as well, um, this is true there in that domain as well. By, f by only picking out the useful data in uh, using AI or ML, you can start to get more data back over the, the limited communications pipeline you may have, and that includes satellite. So we have been able to demonstrate image retrieval over satellite, which you know previously would have been extremely costly. But I think that's a good example of, I think, where AI can really help um, advance the field, at least in, in, in the field tools sec uh, section. From the uh, tech for conservation point of view, we wait until these things get developed by other people, and then we'll work to deliver that to you. So that's really our focus. We are constantly scanning the space. There's a lot going on. But when and if we hear of a product or a service or a capability, uh, that is mature enough, and we'd like to test this and trial it with folks. Uh, our focus uh, is, and we'll continue to be trying to deliver that to you uh, for, for the best results. Yeah, that, that's good to know. So we'll, we'll get to the, later through that after this session. So from, from our point of view at Hector Planet, um, so... Yeah, we've been quite busy deploying like the, the the tech that we have right now, and we recently did a big overhaul of the entire uh, hardware. Uh, so basically, we have we now have like the the smart camera trap and the repeller that I just mentioned is basically now one device. So for us, it's really easy now to deploy. Uh, one of these systems uh, that makes it a lot more uh, cheaper. So, you know, uh, like some years ago, our systems will be very expensive because you could only produce, uh, you know, a small amount of them. And now we have like a professional created PCB that can be produced uh, in factories, so to say. Uh, and it can you know, basically pump out a smart camera trap or it can pump out a, uh, a repeller. So, I mean, that's for us, that's a, that's a big achievement to, to, to have. And we worked, like, we, we worked years for that to, to, to come to that point. Um, and, you know, what's next is uh, it's, it's, it's more of that, basically. It's, you know, keeping that, uh, we have to make it cheaper and cheaper. So uh, the, the, the more uh, change we can leave out, so the, the, the cheaper the system will, will be. So you now see that we have like a bridge, we have a camera, we have a solar panel. So the next thing you will see probably is that the camera and the bridge will be like one unit, for instance. And we already you know, you know, we're talking with, with Sam about it as well. Um, so integrating it more, making it cheaper, so making it more available easily for, for national parks in, uh, in general. So that's on the hardware side of things. And on the software side of things, we're not, uh, you know, we're working on that as well uh, the whole time, basically. So we're also doing projects in Romania, so in, in Europe, and that's a whole different case. We're, we're, we're creating machine learning models to detect bears. So, but you see that works works the same way that we create models for uh, for elephants, and also that process is, is becoming easier and easier. So, in the next years, I'll say I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm certain that um, when a new national park, for instance, will come to us and say, "Hey, we want to do something with smart AI camera traps," that is a total different project in terms of complexity and cost than what we did in the first time in Gabon. So, and that will be easier and, and more uh, uh, affordable. Final thoughts? All right, we have about 10 minutes or so for questions from the audience, if anyone has something that they'd, oh, here we go. Kick us off. Yeah, uh, morning everyone. So uh, the panelists have invariably said that uh, computing resources and IT infrastructure is a big barrier of entry for anyone wants to, anyone want to try out AI. So my question is, I'm probably thinking of a movie plot, so please forgive me. <laughs> uh, my question is, decentralized AI, is that a thing? Can you, inter is there an intersection between blockchain and AI so that I can break down my AI model and let it run across different devices within my organization so that I try to mitigate against that? Thank you. Definitely for somebody technical, so. Uh, <laughs> sure. 
so hopefully I can get your, give you an answer for your question, let me know. But um, so there's a, there's a lot of different approaches you can take. So yes, there are a lot of like cloud-based and very computationally heavy models that you can run. Um, but there are some model, it depends, you know, you can sometimes have to sacrifice the quality of your model, not quality, but just like how many maybe outputs it can give you or the complexity of your model that, so that it can run on a less uh, crazy computer. Um, for example, like the model that I use for Cougar Vision, um, I can actually just run it on my laptop. It's very slow, but I can do it. Um, so that's, it, you often just are sacrificing your time. So if you can have a, uh, a very high power computer, it'll just be much faster for you. But you can oftentimes, depending on your model, run them just you know locally on your computer. Um, and that's usually if you're able to download the model and have it run locally. And then there's also the edge AI context that we were talking about, where there's some devices that have condensed their models to be so tiny that they can run on just a tiny little you know, computer board. Um, so there's definitely a wide array of uh, use cases and applications and possible routes you can take. And you may have to sacrifice you know, some things that you care about in, in terms of your data output. But yeah, hopefully that answers a little bit. Yeah, just quickly to add to that, I think that uh, if you're running a, a computer that can run, you know, uh, other programs, you should be, we should be able to find a model that can, that can work on that computer uh, without having to um, decentralize it in any way. Um, so a, a project that we've been working on at, at Conservation X Labs is essentially running models on your on your desktop or on your laptop um, and and making that process a little easier and, and accessible but I, I would note that you know there has been a lot of optimization in the in the in the space um, the first well the version of megatech that was used for a long time uh, version four uh, was just uh, there's a version five that came out uh, uh, maybe 18 months ago now um, and and that was like a 10 times uh, speed up and so I think you're starting to see these models become um, not smaller, but more efficient, so they can run on more machines faster, so you can get through more data. Um, but I'd be happy to chat afterwards if you have any further questions. Oh yeah, just to add on that. So yeah, we 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 um, had those challenges quite a lot to you know figure out what kinds of uh, models can we train and what does run on the hardware that we that we use. So we ended up using quite some powerful hardware in the in the box that we have. So the SmartBridge that I that I that I mentioned, uh, we actually use a Raspberry Pi 4 compute or a Google Coral device, which is pretty powerful and can run like these insane models. So yeah, you you don't necessarily you you train the models like on your on your powerful computer, but the actual model can run on you know very small devices that are widely available these days. So yeah, that's what we uh, that we ch that chose to do, and that that enables us to create to run these powerful models. So in Gabon we have. Uh, we can detect multiple species, for instance. Whereas, if you you know use an edge device, for instance, or uh, you can you know only run maybe you can identify like elephants only, or it's it's going to be harder. So it's more work than if you have a full-fledged, uh, powerful computer in uh, in the bush. There you go. Hi, Isabel Evans from Ocean Finance Company. Um, I'm just wondering, um, how advanced is AI in marine conservation? Marine conservation. Thank you. Uh, I can speak to uh, uh, individual ID uh, being applied in uh, ocean conservation. Uh, this is for whales and porpoises and other species. So that's, that's uh, out there and that works really well. Um, I know there's uh, other underwater uh, applications as well for, for underwater uh, matching, or IDing of individuals, uh, but I'm not aware of, I don't know specifically of any uh, acoustic work, for instance, but I, I'm sure that that uh, activity is underway somewhere. Anybody? Yeah. So just quickly. Uh, so we're not active in the in the in the marine uh, uh, area yet. But in terms of uh, poaching, we've been working with uh, Greenpeace and Sea Shepherd. Um, and what I know, but you have to correct me if I'm wrong, is that like uh, if there if there's like lots, there's a lot of poaching going on at the oceans, and sometimes sh the ships you know they they turn off their transponders so they don't know where they are, and some illegal activities are taking place there. 
so we would really love to use our GSM sensor in these areas. So we've already have a lot of ideas on how we could do that with you know buoys and you know placing our GSM sensors within these buoys that you get like uh, notifications if you know people are around at that sea where you know at, at that specific point. So I think uh, and that 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 really uh, comes down to the point that I uh, mentioned earlier. I think there are a lot of uh, different things we can use and existing technology that's already out there to you know smartly look into these areas that you're mentioning and see how we can you know use tech that's already out there. Uh, yeah. So if you're interested in that, if you're in the field of like illegal activities at sea, then please visit us uh, <laughs> later on. Uh, j just in general, in that direction, we are working with, and one of our directors on our board uh, is, uh, works in the anti-money laundering space uh, for large banks. And uh, we are working and trying to get down the path of using that same AI uh, to track uh, individuals involved in the wildlife trade. Um, the Wild Meat team, uh, who we lean on for the Wild Book platform, have also supported a shark fin ID package, which allows them to identify the species that are being poached just from their fins. So unfortunately, you know, gruesome way to go, but uh, a useful tool for enforcement um, on, on, the, on the ocean. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this isn't my panel. Um, I just want to underscore the call for more uh, AI in the underwater space. I work at an NGO um, and we have, again, we do, we do the thing that all You're familiar with what that's trying to do, but like I think uh, uh, AI applied to the analytics of, of of the kind of aggregate data, I think is where you'd start to see that kind of benefit. Um, and it's something that we've only really started to see. We did our first like large scale deployment recently, and you start to see trends across the data that I, I feel could where AI could start to pull out uh, information that where you start to bring in not only our sensor data, but other data from maybe uh, geospatial or tag data or, or whatever. And I think that, that fusion of all that data is where you'll start to be able to answer some of those questions. Yeah, so one of my dreams when we de de developed the GSM sensor was that, you know, if we deploy these in a national park, uh, I don't know if you sometimes use Google Maps and it can predict, you know, the, the, your travel time from A to B. It says, well, it's going to probably take you now uh, 45 minutes because traffic is high. And, um, you know, I envision something like that could, uh, could, could be there in the near future where we could have prediction algorithms based on historical data or, you know, real-life data coming from the field that's being aggregated 
and that these prediction algorithms can provide you with information on stuff that's not happened yet but could potentially happen like you know in the near future same as you know prediction algorithms from from google work these days uh, providing you information on your on your trip and that's getting more sophisticated every day so these algorithms are becoming better and better and the more data we have the more information we we, we get from our sensors that we can integrate and use uh, um, these algorithms on uh, that could potentially be uh, very be beneficial for uh, for management of the park yeah. yeah just one thing I'd like to add and I, I'm gonna quote someone else's research of um, it's not, <laughs> this is not work we're doing, but I know there is work happening in like the idea of how to best deploy uh, ranger patrols, for example, and, and you know, like you obviously can choose to put ra uh, do ranger patrols in areas where there's known uh, activity, um, but there's also that trade-off where you're not necessarily patrolling unknown areas as well, and th there has been some work around predicting and, and recommending where rangers should be, you know, be, be deployed um, based on that kind of uh, information on, on historic data. Uh, I think, uh, and I don't know uh, if Louis is here, I think uh, there's been some application uh, around Kruger Park uh, where they're trying to track wild dogs and they're predicting uh, snaring incidents uh, in advance, but I don't know if it's using any AI at this point. Uh, Louis, are you in the room? Yeah, uh, can you com comment on that at all? Uh, maybe I should have listened more carefully to the definition of AI, because I'm not so sure if it's AI. But um, yeah, we just we just look at the historic uh, snare. It's, I think it's similar to maybe paws or something. You know, uh, we we also just look at snare removal data, do a risk map, and then do an algorithm of movement um, of the dogs over the landscape. If it uh, goes over a threshold, which we, a threshold which we could uh, test against proper real snare events, um, it sends an alert uh, to us as the rangers. So yeah, it's, it's, I don't know if it's AI. <laughs> And I'll just say just quickly that, that that definition of AI is pretty fuzzy. I think like at its core, AI is, is a prediction uh, model. Um, we're talking, I think, in this case around you know, a lot of computer vision um, applications of, of AI, but there's, you know, you can't apply it to, to tab. ambush these three gentlemen in the vendor section. Katie might be harder to, to track down, but you'll be around. Please do come up afterwards, um, have a chat, have these di really important discussions. And if you could all please join me in thanking our panel for such a lovely hour. Thank you so much, guys.